Conservation is not all about science. In this episode, I chat with Dr. Felix Landry Yuan to explore the interplay between religion, culture, and conservation. We focus on snakes in Asia because snakes play a large role in the religion, culture, and tradition across Asia. We'll learn all about this and how we can approach conservation in a more multidisciplinary lens. So, hope you enjoy. Welcome to the EcoChat Podcast. We discuss topics in conservation, animal welfare, and environmental science to learn how you and I can make a difference. So, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hey, Felix, how's it going? Going all right, Sam. How are you? I'm doing well. Great to have you here. Yeah, thank you. So your topic of research is quite fascinating. Could you, first of all, set the stage and give us some background? Well, my field of research generally has to do with the interface of history, ecology, sociology within the context of conservation. So looking at a variety of different lenses, um, both social and environmental to come up with these same kinds of outlooks that consider different types of questions within conservation. And within the scope of my PhD, I specifically did this within the context of snakes. And the reason why I chose snakes was because snakes are one of those creatures which are really found in most cultures throughout the world in any way, shape, or form, or in some way, shape, or form, I should say. And I've been around for as long as civilizations have existed and of course longer than that throughout evolutionary time and asia in particular is interesting because snakes are found in a variety of cultures in this part of the world um but in ways that are still very much relevant today in contemporary society so that was essentially the gist of the research that i did in recent years Hmm. and what's the importance of snakes in nature and society Right. So I think the roles of snakes are very much multifaceted. So they could be utilitarian in the sense where pest control is one of them, right? So you have snakes that come and eat rats, of course, good for some people. But snakes can also serve as food in some cases. Um, For example, in Hong Kong, snakes are common for snake soup. Snakes could also be used for their leather, you know, to make accessories that type of thing so there's a very much there's very much a utilitarian aspect to snakes in this part of the world but also there is the spiritual aspect of snakes where in many different cultures you do have certain belief systems that worship snakes or snake gods nice and we'll definitely dive deeper into the cultural and religious value of snakes but could you also touch on the ecological importance yeah So snakes can often be considered to be an ecological indicator because snakes are very much at the middle point in the food chain, right? So you have snakes that are eating small animals, but you also have bigger animals that are feeding on snakes, you know, big predatory or big predator birds, raptors um, that might be feeding on snakes. So snakes actually have this important middle role in a lot of food chains in, in these ecosystems. So you mentioned Asia in particular, And that's also where you did the bulk of your work. So help me understand why Asia. Um, I would say for me personally, Asia was purely circumstantial. Um, At the time, I was starting some of my work in Japan on the Izu Islands. And there I was really looking at this ecological... We were looking at snakes from a very much an ecological perspective. So looking at the snake and lizard predator prey dynamics on the Izu Islands south of Tokyo. And while doing that work... I was thinking of other potential projects that could be of interest. And there was this faith and science collaborative research scheme grant that came about. And together with my supervisor, we came up with this potential idea of looking at sacred groves in southwestern India in the Western Ghats. And so doing a bit more research on the sacred groves, I found out that actually a lot of those sacred groves are very much um, devoted to snake gods or snake deities. And I thought that fit in quite nicely with my other project in Japan, which had to do with snakes, even though it was kind of a, a different type of process of looking at snakes. 
But then being based in Hong Kong, you look at another type of relationship that snakes might have with people or the environment, and that's snake soup, where people eat snakes, right? So tying all of those three ideas together, you have the ecological role of snakes, you have the spiritual relationships between people and snakes in southwestern India, and then you have the utilitarian relationship between humans and snakes in Hong Kong, where snakes are food in the, sh- in the, sh- in the shape of or in the form of snake soup. So really, I thought that was an interesting triangle to look at. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure how that would compare to other parts of the world just yet. I mean, I know, I know snakes are used in many other ways in different parts of the world. But in this case, I guess out of geographical uh, convenience, it made sense in this case. Very fascinating. All right, well, let's first talk about the spiritual part, and then we can move on to the utilitarian part afterwards. So, yeah, tell us more about the role of snakes in religion in India. And, like, for example, how many snake deities are there, and what do snakes represent in the religion? So, if we look at it historically, I'm not necessarily a historical expert in this sense, but it I get I get the sense that there's this mixing of indigenous belief systems with the more general Hindu belief system where you have this commonality with serpent gods in that sense. And I think that if you look at it within the context of sacred groves, you often have a serpent god which is seen as a kind of protective deity and you could call it by a variety of names depending on where you are. But for example, the, the general Sanskrit name Naga would be something that's commonly used. And so I guess Naga is a really common theme when it comes to serpent gods throughout that whole region. So not just the southwestern, not just southwestern part of India, but in, in other parts of the, con- of the subcontinent as well, where the serpent god would have this type of, um, or it'd be, it'd be made to look like a cobra in a sense with the hood and everything. So usually the Nagas would tend to be associated with something that looks more like a cobra rather than other types of snakes. And what exactly is a sacred grove? Well, a sacred sacred grove could be classified under the broader category of sacred natural sites, which are tracts of land that have been preserved or devoted to certain cultural beliefs or practices, um, as well as spiritual beliefs and practices. And as a result, have been preserved in the, in the sense that the natural environment is preserved and or a species that lives within them would be protected in that kind of sense through this bottom up cultural valuation of them. And sacred groves are the sacred forests, which are found in many parts of the world, really. There's some common examples in, in Ghana, in, um, Cameroon. In Ethiopia, um, and India makes up a very interesting place for looking at sacred groves because they're so common throughout the whole South Asian continent. So not just in India, but in Sri Lanka as well, for example, and in Nepal. So the sacred groves that are found in the southwestern part, specifically those that straddle along the western Ghats. So that's the southern part of Karnataka state and the northern part of Kerala state. You have these sacred groves there, which are notorious or i would i wouldn't say notorious but i would say known to be devoted to serpent gods in particular so most sacred groves are usually devoted to some kind of deity but the ones in the western gods region are specifically devoted oftentimes to a serpent god which makes it quite unique in the sense that the people who live in or i wouldn't say live in because no one really lives within those sacred groves but that live around those sacred groves or that visit them tend to, as a result of their devotional beliefs or cultural practices related to those sacred groves, have a unique relationship with snakes there. Interesting. Definitely curious to learn more about this relationship. Um, But I just want to take a step back and, and understand more about the religion first. So is there like a hierarchy among the gods? And like, where do snake gods fit in with the rest of the gods in their religion i don't know about a hierarchy but i do know that there's this type of difference in roles played so 
in the case of the Nagas, it seems like they often tend to be associated with the protective element of certain temples that are within these sacred groves. So at many at many temple sites, you'd find the Nagas at the corners of some of the temple structures, sort of guarding or protecting the area. But also the Nagas can be associated with the fertility of the land. And so that's why in many of these sacred groves, you have this body of water that you can enter and wash your hands and feet to purify yourself before entering the forest. You mentioned the Nagas are usually associated with cobras. So I was wondering, are cobras basically the representative species? Or are there other species of snakes that represent gods? As far as I know, there's a few types of snake gods. I forget the names. There, We were told a, a variety of them, depending on the different sites we visited, um, both in Kerala and Karnataka. But in general, it seems like there's this specific distinction to be made between the serpent gods or the nagas and the actual living snakes that people encounter. And so the way that it seems to be is that the snakes that are encountered in person are a manifestation or related to the serpent gods, even though they're not necessarily the same thing. The snake gods tend to be represented as cobra-looking figures, but the way that people interact with other snake species can be similar in the sense that people won't kill or harm snakes within those sacred groves. So regardless of the snake species, oftentimes people who enter the sacred groves and encounter snakes, they'll there's a taboo against harming or killing them. Right, because but, they're considered manifestations of the snake gods, right? Yeah, that's right. And so the cobras themselves, however, so they, at some point during that study, I remember we were asking participants which snakes they believed to be sacred in particular, and we'd show them pictures of different species of snakes. And many of the participants actually pointed to the photo of the Indian cobra, and if you look at the Indian cobra, you can see that there's the hood and you have this spectacled pattern on the back of the hood. And if you look at imagery or Hindu imagery, you'll see that the Nagas are often portrayed in that same way with the hood and the spectacled pattern. So I'm assuming there is much more of a spiritual or devotional role played by the Indian cobra in particular in this case, although I didn't quite delve into that aspect of it too much. Do you think the reason why cobras are more often portrayed in religion is because they're just more easy to be identified and they're also more charismatic? So, but for for listeners who might not be familiar with cobras, cobras are basically a type of snake which can raise their heads and also flatten their, their neck so it looks like they have a hood. And so it's it's a lot more charismatic, and it's this is kind of unique to this group of snakes. So, yeah, would that be the reason why they're more prevalent in the religion? Yeah, cobras are quite iconic looking, right? They're very unique looking, and they're also quite common, and they're mostly active at many times of the day, and they're terrestrial, so they seem to be roaming around the fields a lot so they're quite easy to spot and i think as a result they're also responsible for a lot of snake bite happening in south asia so i think people just tend to encounter cobras a lot so i think that combination of factors might be why cobras in particular are so important in this case i'm glad you mentioned snake bite because that's definitely a topic we'll we'll dive deeper into in a second Going back to sacred groves, so you mentioned they're they're basically protected areas where people do worship, right? So, what's it? What exactly is inside a sacred grove? Right. So I would I would use that term protected area quite loosely because the sacred grove, generally, right, in its most pristine state, is just that it's protected wild forest with some kind of shrine or temple associated with it. Um, but there is a spectrum of the extent to which sacred groves are degraded, at least in terms of habitat. So, for example, if you go to some of the more urban areas, the sacred groves there are still recognized as a sacred grove. That The, the physical space 
or the physical area is recognized as a sacred grove, but the green space within those sacred groves might be less. So you'd have more infrastructure, like temple infrastructure, for example, um, being more built up and you'd have less big trees within that forest. So the term is quite broad in that sense. Are these sacred groves legally protected or is there like pretty much nothing legally that says you can't cut down the forest, but it's just preserved because people worship there and it, it, it's considered sacred? Yeah. Again, I think it, there, there's quite a spectrum where you have some sacred groves that are potentially overlapping with the government implemented protected areas, but then you also have other sacred groves, which are simply recognized as a forest which you don't cut down or something that you do preserve um, from this bottom-up cultural valuation perspective. So I think that's an interesting contrast, right? Because if you look at your typical conservation approaches, which are really top-down, such as government-implemented protected areas or you know national parks, for example, where they limit and manage the amount of people that come into those places and who gets to live there and who gets to interact with that space in what way. Whereas if it's from a bottom-up perspective, so in this case, the cultural valuation of a certain forest, in this case, that in itself is much more maybe conducive to the long-term protection of those places. Although it's, you know, it, it it's protected in a very different way, but I just think that looking at it from a bottom up versus top down way is really an interesting contrast. Yeah, this contrast is very interesting. So you mentioned that a bottom up approach could have more longer term effects versus a, a top down conservation approach. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I'm trying to figure out as well. Um I guess intuitively it seems like it would be more long-term since it comes from an inherent will to protect whatever it might be, whatever natural entity might be at play in the sense where people don't necessarily need convincing to do it, right? Because it's, it's culturally rooted. Um, the behavior in itself is something which isn't necessarily taught from a foreign entity. So I guess in that, that's where I would look at it. Yeah, I, I do get your point. Um, this bottom-up approach seems more intrinsically motivating, right? Whereas for a top-down approach where, let's say, the government say, you can't enter this area, you can't do this, you can't do that, it at times seems imposing. Right, right, exactly. Where, you know, you know, I mean, if you look at it from the... People talk about this a lot these days, but, you know, fortress conservation where you have these big protected areas that kick everybody out. So the people who have lived there for hundreds or even thousands of years are now restricted to their movements within or around those forests and that kind of thing. So you have this ethical dilemma as well. And if you look at it from the, the bottom up perspective, it might make more sense where it's really looking at a type of approach, which promotes the conservation of both nature and culture. So a bit more of a biocultural approach to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And yeah, I think encouraging the willingness of people intrinsically to participate in conservation would be a lot more impactful long term, in addition to, you know, the, the top down approach. So, I mean, these two approaches are mutually exclusive. And if we can incorporate both aspects, then it can be all the more effective. So going back to sacred groves, can you elaborate more on well, what exactly do people do in the sacred groves or, or what's their purpose? A lot of these sacred groves are used for, of course, spiritual practices. So oftentimes there are certain festivals that happen at certain times of year and ceremonies that take place. And within these sacred groves, as I mentioned before, there's usually some kind of temple or shrine associated with it. So people would visit these temples or shrines for these specific ceremonies or gatherings, which might happen a few times a year. Um, so a lot of people who visit sacred groves might only visit them uh, a few times a year. But then there are other sacred groves, which are in the more rural areas where people might visit them to gather certain materials, such as firewood and that kind of thing. And that 
although, although I think it depends on, you know, it, of course it does depend on the site, but for the most part, people would visit the sacred groves for um, ceremonies and rituals, which have to do with the spiritual practices surrounding those sacred groves. And I think you touched on this before, but does each grove involve only one deity? If I remember correctly, there's usually one main deity affiliated with each sacred grove, but then there might be a couple of other secondary ones. Yeah, I think, again, it depends on which one. But usually, if if I remember correctly, it, used to, it would usually be one central deity. Got it. So, moving on to your study now, what exactly did you look at in terms of snakes and sacred groves? We were generally interested in the relationship between people and snakes, of course, but how did the devotional beliefs play into the relationships that people had with snakes? So, more specifically... Does the worshiping of snakes or snake deities lead to people being more pacifistic towards snakes? So it was a interview approach, right? Where we visited 30 different sacred groves. Um, I think more than half of which were affiliated with a uh, snake deity or serpent god and the other portion, which did not. So affiliated with some other god or deity. And we asked them a whole bunch of questions and in the end, what we found was that people did actually have this taboo against the killing or harming of snakes, so as long as they encounter them within the sacred groves themselves. Interesting. So people are less likely to harm snakes if encountered inside sacred groves. That's right. That's right. So it was an overarching taboo against the killing of snakes. If these people encounter snakes outside of the sacred grove, then what would be their response? Then there is a portion of people who would actually harm, kill, or displace the snake if the snake was potentially harmful. So, for example, if a snake is encountered um, in the field, in the agricultural fields, or in the village, or near people's homes, in that case, the snake might be moved. And in, and, and it tended to be mostly male participants who would be willing to harm or move a snake. Why do you think there's such a stark contrast between how people handle snakes inside the groves and outside? Because the sacred groves seem to be respected as a sacred place, especially for snakes. Um, and it seems like there is really this, this overarching respect for that space, which is recognized as a sacred grove in itself. Yeah. It seems like there's a slight contradiction here. So you mentioned that the people view snakes as the manifestation of the Naga snake god, right? Yeah. So snakes encountered inside the sacred groves would be respected and not harmed. But if the snake is encountered outside of the sacred grove, then it might be a different story. So help me understand that. Like, do, do the people perceive these snakes as no longer associated with the snake god? Well, I don't know if that's the case because there were still quite a lot of people that would still not harm a snake if encountered outside of the sacred grove. I think it just came down to some people which, you know, still had the devotional beliefs, but, you know, they were willing to protect themselves or their families if necessary. So let's see it that way. And as we, as we mentioned before, snake bite is a really big issue in South Asia. So it makes sense in that way. But also, if we look at the reasons why people worship snake gods in the first place, or worship, or worship snake gods and therefore not kill real snakes in the first place, there were two main reasons. One of them being purely devotion, right? So out of devotion for the snake god or deity, um, they won't want to kill or harm the physical manifestation of it. But in another way, people who worshipped did so because they wanted to avoid getting bitten by a snake in the future or being afflicted by a Naga Dosha, which is a type of serpent god curse. So there was this this worship out of fear, which was also prevalent. So in that case, if a snake is coming into your home and you feel as if you might be bitten, and the whole reason that you're worshiping in the first place is out of fear, well, in that case, it does make sense to protect yourself, right? Yeah, that makes sense. So it seems like one of the main takeaways from your study is that religion can intrinsically 
drive people to protect and respect snakes and nature inside these sacred groves. Is that correct? That's correct. As well as the space. The space itself is believed to be sacred too. Okay, so how can we apply what we learned from this to supplement existing conservation efforts? Any ideas off the top of your head? In the sense of applying it to conservation, um, if we look at the ways that, if we look at the approaches to conservation that really value human nature relationships, I think we can look at sacred groves and, uh, as an example of coexistence where people really are coexisting with a non-human animal, and in this case, snakes. So in the sense where snakes could potentially be recognized as a stakeholder, right? So not just something which is below us, but really as a creature or a being almost on equal footing in the sense of an inhabitant of that space. Does that does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Right. So I, I so I think it, in that sense that can inform different applications to conservation. Where really, of course, there are you know things like ecosystem services which are really important, but also really considering other non-human animals as equal stakeholders in that sense. I'm curious if you looked at how religious beliefs have changed with younger generations. Yeah, we we sort of looked at that, but it didn't seem to be there didn't seem to be any obvious pattern. Um, a lot of the youth which we interviewed were still well, still held firm beliefs regarding sacred groves and the serpent gods. I don't know if there's other factors that play as to why you know they they might have been responding that way, but it's statistically it seemed like it's not really um, there isn't really that big of a difference. Oh, that's kind of surprising. I was thinking the younger generations would be less religious, but I'm guessing that's not the case. Yeah. As far as I remember, as far as I remember, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay. So Asia is such an interesting place to study this because on one hand, snakes are a very prominent part of the culture and religion across Asia, right? Not just limited to India, but on the other hand, Asia also has by far the highest amount of snake bite incidents, well, at yeah. least reported snake bite incidents and deaths in the world. So, yeah, how did these two dynamics interplay? Yeah, and, and that's really interesting, right? Because if we look at a lot of um, beliefs pertaining to snake gods, a lot of them are rooted in the Dharmic religions, and Dharmic religions are the ones associated with or the ones that are, you know, tend to be related to Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, um, Sikhism as well. So all of those tend to have the theme of the serpent gods. And it is, it, it, yeah, it's very interesting that there's so, there's so much snake bite in South Asia, yet there's so many beliefs pertaining to snake gods and serpent gods for reasons that are definitely related. Um, I think that the reason why people or why snake gods are so such an important part of those religions might be as a result or reflecting um, the human snake relations that have occurred there for so long. So uh, yeah, I don't think I don't think they're those two have developed in parallel. Why do you think there's so much snake bite in Asia versus the rest of the world? It seems like the prevalence of, I mean, at least in, in terms of human snake conflicts in South Asia, it seems like. Cobras in particular are probably the most prevalent snake when it comes to those occurrences, right? And and that makes sense if we relate it to what we were talking about before, to the prevalence of cobras um, in these serpent god beliefs, as well as in you know Hindu imagery and iconography. So yeah, cobras definitely. Right, that makes sense because cobras are mostly found in Asia and some parts of Africa, right? Yeah, as far as I know, as far as I know, yeah. And come to think of it, that's why Egypt has snake gods as well, right? Yeah, the cobras are important in Egypt, or in Egyptian lore, for sure. Um, at least in ancient Egypt. Like you just mentioned, they are common in Africa as well. And there are a variety of snake myths in Africa and in many parts of it. I, I know that in Western Africa, the, the pythons play an important spiritual world role in many cultures. Very fascinating. 
So you mentioned the term human-snake conflict a moment ago. Can you explain what that is? Human-snake conflict is the essentially a human-snake relationship which is detrimental to one or both parties, whether humans or snakes. Of course, you know, if you look at the snake bite, that's definitely a conflict, right? Because it's at the detriment, it's to the detriment of people that get bitten by the snakes. Um, another case of human snake conflict would be the encroachment of things being built by people onto snake habitat where people might be potentially not only kicking snakes out by reducing their habitat, but potentially killing snakes out of fear for them. So there's that too. So there's, I think, I think those would be the main ones, right? People getting bitten by snakes and snakes getting killed by people. How often do snake bites occur? Like, do you have any numbers on the, the daily amount? Oh, that, I, yeah, that, that I don't know. That I don't know because I'm sure so many people get bitten by snakes every day or at least not venomous snakes. All right. So depends on the snake you get bitten by it, but I'm assuming the venomous ones are the ones that get reported. Makes sense. What are some of these venomous ones that cause the most incidents? Um, as we mentioned before, cobras are one, but besides cobras, one of the more, um, notorious snake would be the, the, the crate, right? The, the crates, the many bedded crates, for example. The varieties of crates that are found in India and in South Asia in general are responsible for a big chunk of snake bite, especially deadly snake bite that happens over there. Can you briefly describe what a crate looks like? A crate is a banded, a long banded snake. So it's not necessarily huge in size, but I guess that's relative to what you're used to seeing. But they tend to be banded white and black, some banded yellow and black. And they're usually active at night. And as a result, I think a lot of the bites from crates tend to happen at nighttime, whether it's because people are walking in fields barefooted or maybe someone is rolling over onto a crate by accident while they're sleeping. But crates, I believe, have a neurotoxic venom, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think it targets your nervous system. Yeah. So you mentioned that snake bites can occur from people walking in the fields at night and stepping on a snake. What are some other common scenarios, and why do snake bites happen in the first place? Snake bites tend to happen because of the mismatch between the priorities between people and snakes. But I think that snake bite usually happens because the snake is defending itself um so the snake tends to the, the a snake would tend to bite a person out of fear of that person rather than a snake chasing down someone to hunt them down or for any other reason so if we look at the occurrences of snake bite i would be surprised if the vast majority of them or at least a lot of them happened either at night or in the daytime when um people are working in the fields where in both cases the snake might be seen too late. So, for example, if you accidentally step on a snake in, in tall grass or at night if you're not wearing shoes or, you know, as we mentioned before, sleeping. So for people working in the fields during the day, what are the work conditions like? What types of fields are we talking about? And how exactly would they trigger a snake bite? Yeah, I mean, agricultural fields, right? So it could be wheat, could be rice, could be... um it could be coffee if it's in the highlands. So, I mean, whether you're barefoot or whether you are wearing shoes and you have some kind of skin exposed, I guess if you accidentally step on a snake, the chances of getting bitten are higher. So really, yeah. So, and it usually, so, so as a result, when we think about the people that do get afflicted by snake bite, it tends to be um, people that are more working class in that sense. So it is a, a a socioeconomic problem as well. So, of course, if you're, you know, the people that are more higher class that are spending time in, inside air conditioned buildings and driving cars wouldn't necessarily be afflicted by snake bite just as much. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So, on that note, what type of land use would you say would have the most snake bite incidents? Would it be like agricultural areas or urban areas or something else? It's, I think it's, I think it's rural areas off the top of my head. I would say it's definitely rural areas. 
where you have a high concentration of people yet to the point where you still have some natural habitat for snakes to live in. It's at that, 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 um, that final frontier, that frontier right there between human society and snake habitat. So, yeah, that makes sense. What can these people do to reduce or mitigate the risk of snake bite? Walk around with a light at night. That would be, I, I heard, I heard, I heard that a few times before. Um, that would definitely help prevent a lot of it. Wearing shoes as well at night um, when walking through those fields. Those are definitely the major ones that I can, that I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, definitely foot, proper footwear when it comes to walking through habitats, uh, which inhabit snakes. But I think it also takes an intuitive awareness, right? Simply being mindful of where you do step or at least uh, be on the lookout. Try to, you know, it's definitely worth investing some time and, and looking out for snakes on the ground and clearing some of the grass, which might be covering or obstructing your vision. But, you know, at the same time, it's hard for me or anybody in this field to really tell people who are actually working on the grounds how to <laughs> not get bit by snakes if it does happen, right? Um, I don't know. You know, it's really, it, sometimes it comes down to bad luck too, right? So it's, it's, yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah. Sometimes they're just at the wrong place at the wrong time. What about being louder or walking more loudly? Would that make a difference? Yeah. I, I'm not sure how snakes respond to sound. I do know they don't have, they have, they lack external ears, right? So they don't have holes in their craniums like lizards would or people do. So, the, the way they perceive sound is definitely different. So I, but I don't know to what extent they don't perceive sound at all. They definitely do perceive vibrations or they are very sensitive to vibrations on the ground. Very interesting. We got a lot to cover today. So let's now move on to talk about the utilitarian aspect of snakes, specifically snake soup in East Asia. But is there anything else you want to mention in terms of snake bite or the role of snakes in religion? before we move on? No, but I think we'll definitely go back to it when we talk about snake soup. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, talk to us about snake soup or just the consumption of snakes in general. Right. Well, I'm, you know, uh, it's pretty common knowledge that a lot of snakes are eaten in different parts of East and Southeast Asia for different reasons. Um, but in, in Hong Kong and in the Guangdong province of China in particular, snake soup is a is an age-old tradition um, of Cantonese cuisine, which has been around for a long time. And so snake soup is something which you'd see in the specific shops devoted to it if you walk around Hong Kong, for those of you who have been here. Is snake soup pretty much limited to Hong Kong and Guangdong? In, in that way, cooked in that way, as far as I know, yeah, is a very Cantonese thing. So why snake soup? Like, is there any health benefits or does it represent something? Because it's said to warm the body. So in the wintertime, it's especially popular. So there's medicinal properties to the snake soup. Also, it's said to be good for rheumatism or to fight against rheumatism. What's that? It, I think it's something related to your joints. It's related to arthritis. Is there any scientific evidence that snake soup does have these medicinal properties? Uh, not that I know of. Okay, so it's kind of just rooted in the Cantonese culture, I guess? That's right. What species of snakes are usually used for snake soup? Um, There's a variety of snakes that are said to be used in snake soup, but what we found through genetic analyses um, of samples coming from these snake soup shops was that the two most common species were the common rat snake and that one is found, you know, not just in Hong Kong, but in southern China, as well as in throughout Southeast Asia. So a very, a very commonly distributed snake in this part of the world. But another common one was the spitting cobra, which is, I believe, endemic to Indonesia. Najas putatrix, the Javan spitting cobra. I'm quite sure it's restricted to the Indonesian islands. So those two seem to be the most common. Good. Interesting. So you already touched on this a bit, but where do the snakes come from? Well, it seems like the snakes used to come from mainland China, but that over time, this may have switched to 
Southeast Asia, so mainly Indonesia, for example, and to a certain extent, Thailand and Malaysia as well. So I think that these days, quite few of the snakes actually come from around Hong Kong, although it is possible, right? But I think for the most part, these snakes tend to be coming from Indonesia, actually, and um, to a certain extent, mainland China as well, still. I assume these are farmed snakes? Well, I mean, that's hard to answer because the concept of a snake farm can be very vague where you have some farms that really are breeding and raising snakes and other farms that are bringing in wild-caught snakes and fattening them up for the trade. So it's hard to say. But I mean, I think there are cases of laundering at snake farms, really, so therefore not necessarily being the most um, ecologic, ecologically or ethically responsible source of snakes. Um, but yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, I would imagine snake farms are pretty unregulated, at least compared to regular farms. So going back to India and South Asia for a sec, do those cultures eat snakes? As far as I know, no. So it seems it, it, there seems to be a geogra geographical barrier being the Himalayas between yeah between snake territory. Hmm. Interesting. Why do you think there's this discrepancy? Do you think it has to do with religion? So if you look at if historically looking at the spread of Buddhism from India, which is a Dharmic religion as mentioned before, you had the influx of spirituality based to a certain extent around the Nagas. So if you look at many Buddhist temples today, um, in different parts of East and Southeast Asia, you still do have some representation of snakes and serpents. Um, for example, in, in Thailand with, um, and other parts of Southeast Asia where Hinduism had actually reached before Buddhism even arrived, you know, where like Cambodia, for example, the presence of Nagas is there, um, to the extent where you do have cobra idols in some of those temples. But those ta it seems like those taboos against the killing of snakes has been potentially eroded with time. I think I, I, I found somewhere in the literature where there were taboos against killing snakes in parts of China as a result of Buddhism in the early days. Um, and still to this day in Japan, there are parts of Japan where there are taboos against killing snakes. Actually, the, you know, and for a variety of reasons, but talking about places that I visited personally, the, the, in the Izu Islands on one of the sites that I visited for the project, which we talked about earlier, Kozu, Kozu Shima. So Kozu Island, there is apparently a taboo against the killing of the rat snakes found on that island. So it's, it's definitely an interesting pattern. Fascinating. So you mentioned that this taboo of killing or consuming snakes has eroded, at least relative to South Asia. Is that correct? It seems that way. It seems that way, yeah. I mean, at least if there was an overarching taboo in the first place history. And so I think that's something to look at for sure. Because that's interesting right there, right, is looking at how the history shapes the present day relationships that people have with snakes and what that current re or what that relationship with snakes was in the past and how that changed over time and why what do you think has led to this erosion yeah i don't know i don't know um i mean buddhism has evolved and transformed in so many different ways and hinduism has disappeared in all of southeast asia except bali so it's it's yeah and and it goes to show too that you know the the beliefs pertaining to snakes and the taboos against killing them in South Asia aren't necessarily purely rooted in the Dharmic religions such as Hinduism, um, but are definitely related to local culture in it itself, whether that's indigenous or or or, or not. Hmm, very interesting. So going back to snake soup now, what exactly was your study about? So the study was about looking at the intersections between conservation and culture within the snake soup industry. So when we look at the wildlife trade, especially in East Asia, oftentimes it seems to be a bit more one-sided from the perspective of conservation. I'm um, looking at a traditional practice, which is then labeled or deemed as 
detrimental to nature and therefore is bad. And the idea was to explore a snake soup from more of a two-sided perspective. So looking at both the cultural and the ecological importance of the snake soup practice, or sorry, not importance, but the, the implications of the snake soup practice. So why snake soup is important, what it means to the culture, and also what it could mean ecologically and the places in which the snakes are coming from. Right. So for that, we had to, to conduct interviews with people asking about their perspectives towards snake soup, the customs related to it, and the current state of the tradition. So these were shopkeepers. Um, but also we obtained some snake meat samples from the shopkeepers to then conduct genetic analyses to see which snakes are actually being served. What were the key findings from this study? There isn't much that is similar to snake soup, at least in contemporary Cantonese cuisine, as far as I know. Because if you look at snake soup on its own, it's very, it's a very unique looking type dish, right? Compared to other types of street food or food that you would get in Hong Kong or otherwise Guangdong province. Because it uses dried lemon leaves. So the leaves of a lemon tree, I, th I think it's from the lemon tree that are sliced thinly that you add into your soup along with these fried um, crackers. So the taste in itself, because of those lemon leaves, um, is quite unique compared to other Cantonese food. So I think it's, it's, it seems to be like a, a, uh, a very old school tradition, um, reminiscent of past Cantonese street food. So in that case is a cultural icon. And so if, if you look at how that relates to, or at which point that intersects with, con with conservation, well, if, if we consider how snake soup is being sourced right now for its meat. The common rat snake in itself isn't necessarily an endangered species, although it was classified as threatened at some point in, in, in Indonesia because of the trade in the 90s. But overall, I think if snake soup or if snake meat for the snake soup is sourced ethically and sustainably, so for example, through properly managed snake farms, which actually raise and breed their snakes in an ethical way, because snakes really don't take up that much or that many resources when we think about it, right? Compared to other meats um, or other domesticated meats, snakes can be fed once a week. They don't drink that much water. They produce little waste and they don't take up much space. So relative to other animal snakes are actually quite easy to farm. So if the snakes themselves are sourced in an ethical and sustainable manner, then I think that's a win-win when it comes to environmental issues as well as the preservation of a cultural tradition in Hong Kong. Well, this is a whole nother rabbit hole we can go down. <laughs> yeah. But since you mentioned ethically sourced or ethically raised snake farms, I was wondering, does that even exist right now? Because just based on what I've seen online, the the conditions of these snake farms are pretty filthy and yeah, I, I assume they're unregulated and they definitely don't meet animal welfare conditions. Yeah. So talk to us about that. I mean, hypothetically, right? It, it's possible. To to what extent it's it's applied and it exists, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking about you know. I mean, if, I guess it's it's a relative question when it comes down to to the meat industries in general, right? If if your meat is farmed, what is it and what kind of environment is it grown and is it ethical well is one more ethical than the other it's hard to say fair enough and to your point on being ethically sourced do you know like what portion of these snakes are farmed versus caught in the wild no no i don't but i mean at least in terms of yeah pure raw data but at least from the interviews with the shopkeepers it seems as though according to them all the snakes are wild caught oh wow so I don't know if that's because they're actually wild caught or if it's because there's a certain prestige with or preference for wild caught snakes in the same way that people now prefer wild caught salmon, for example. Do you have any data on how many snakes roughly are consumed on a regular basis? Not really. I think there was one shop that had many, many, many tons per year. I forget which one, but yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. Well, it's not a lot to work with, but um, based on this shop owner's answer of 
having many, many tons of snakes per year. And then based on what you mentioned before, where the, the shop owner claims that all of these snakes are sourced from the wild, so they're not farmed, they're caught in the wild. Do you think this is a sustainable practice? I think relative to the other meat industries, it is. Um, once again, very hard to say. I mean, of course, in general, the consumption of meat is, it, 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 you know, it, it's a very tricky, it's a very tricky thing to talk about, you know, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. I would say just purely on, on, you know, looking at how much snake meat is being consumed in Hong Kong, looking at, you know, based on the, the amount of shops that are there compared to pork or chicken or, you know, seafood. It's it's hard to imagine that the dent it's having is as impactful as those other industries. I mean, so as long so as long as we're not talking about you know critically endangered or endangered species being consumed, right? But I mean, that's exact and that's exactly what needs to be looked into. I think that's the next step. Of course, is to really get on those grounds, figure out where those snakes are coming from, and get a sense of what the ecological impact is of consuming snakes. Okay, so going back to your research question, were you comparing the cultural value of snake soup versus the ecological impact of this practice? Is that how you would word it? Yeah, exactly. How do you even put a value to yeah. the cultural benefits of this? Yeah, no, it was it was done in a very. I mean, at least I was just purely out of uh, qualitative assessments. But yeah, I mean, and that's where it gets tricky, right? I think that's why in conservation, it's so there's so much of a focus purely first and foremost on the species that are being um, threatened because it's quantifiable in numbers oftentimes. Um, culture isn't always as easily quantifiable. So I guess overall, the the point that I was trying to make is simply to highlight the importance of culture and highlight the value of, or the highlight the potential value of culture um, intrinsically when it comes to assessing these issues you know, in the environmental sense. So if we look back at India and neighboring areas where the people there worship snake gods, there's a spiritual aspect to the snakes, right? And the people there, they respect snakes to a certain extent. I'm curious for the people in Hong Kong or Guangdong, how how do they perceive snakes? I don't know about Guangdong, but I came across this this place in Fujian province where they do still where there is this snake god that's worshipped at certain times of year. I think that you know, especially over the last couple of years, there's been this spike in interest in snakes. If you look at that Hong Kong Snakes Facebook page, for example, the numbers of people joining it has skyrocketed. So it seems like there's a a big growing interest in snakes from people from a variety of ages, it seems like. But I mean, I think, and also I think that the in, the snake bite incidences hung in Hong Kong, at least the reported snake bites, are very, is very low compared to other parts of Southeast Asia or South Asia. Um, so it seems like snake bite isn't that big of an issue here, even though there are a lot of snakes found here. So I guess there isn't that... It's it's not considered to be that big of an issue. Okay. I'm also curious, tying our conversation back to the sacred groves in India, is there any equivalent to sacred groves in Hong Kong and Guangdong where the snakes are consumed? Well, that would be the feng shui woods, yeah. Cool. And what are those? Well, at least in Hong Kong, the feng shui woods are considered to be, at least by biologists, the closest thing to primary forest that we can find here. Because most, or if nearly all of Hong Kong, the forests in Hong Kong are less than 60 or 70 years old or something like that. So the feng shui woods being the closest thing to what forest could have been before that. And the feng shui woods are forests that are affiliated with a village so if you if you're familiar if you're not familiar with the topography of hong kong it's a very very hilly environment and many of these villages tend to be found at the foot of these hills 
And in the, when there are feng shui woods, these feng shui woods are found typically between the village and the mountains, so right at the foot of the hill. And these feng shui woods are believed to serve a variety of purposes. Um, so functional in the sense that they provide warming in the winter or they shield against the winds in the winter and in the summer provide some cooling. And beyond that, they also have or serve um, a utilitarian purpose in the sense that people might go to harvest certain resources or, you know, they might plant certain medicinal plants or other plants that are useful in other ways. So that in general, that's what a feng shui wood is. Okay. And same question that I asked on the, the sacred groves. Are these feng shui woods legally protected or are they just preserved intrinsically by the people? Right. So in, in general, feng shui woods are recognized as such by the people living around them that are at least aware of them. Because in a lot of these vi vi villages, you have people that have moved in recently that may not be as aware of. But traditionally, the feng shui woods are have been recognized by the people as such. But there definitely is an overlap between these feng shui woods and um, the government protection allocated to certain green spaces. Um, a good example is in Lai Chi Wo, which is an old Hakka village found in the northeastern part of Hong Kong. The the village there has a feng shui wood right behind it at the foot of the hill. And that one is not only protected by the government, but it's also highlighted in ecotourism, right? As of, I think it's the only properly labeled feng shui wood, the, the only feng shui wood that's labeled as such um, by the signs that you would see there. And and and, it's, and also you have some feng shui woods which might overlap to to varying degrees with the country parks, which are Hong Kong's government protected areas, the country park system. So there's that too. It seems that these feng shui woods, at least in some cases, is another example of this bottom up conservation approach, right? Where the the local people or the villagers that live there are intrinsically willing to preserve these forests. Would you say that's true? At least traditionally, at least with the people that are aware of them. On that note, how do younger generations view feng shui woods? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it depends on the site you visit, but it seems like, in general, a, a, a lot of people can appreciate a forest right behind their villages in their backyards, right? And so I think, you know, so as long as someone might appreciate a forest in their backyard, they wouldn't, they would be against the cutting of it. How do you see the future of sacred groves or feng shui woods where, you know, these are areas that are kind of embedded in the local culture and the people there are intrinsically preserving it. Do you think these areas can continue to persist in the long term? I think that beliefs evolve and traditions evolve as they should and that the relationships that people have with forests will always be present in some way, shape, or form. I think that, for example, the way that we approach conservation today is very much nested in the biological sciences, although perhaps in the past, conservation wouldn't necessarily have been distinct from, you know, the, the arts and the humanities, for example, or even politics or whatever it might be. Um, but I think that maybe if we look at these sacred natural sites, such as sacred groves or, or, or fossil woods, um, and compare them to the new protected areas that are popping up, we should bear in mind that given a few hundred years, the way that those sites are perceived will change, whether good or bad. That makes sense. All right, so we covered a lot of ground today, first talking about sacred groves and snake gods in India, and then moving on to snake bites in South Asia, and then snake soup in East Asia, and then kind of circling back to the cultural and spiritual aspects of natural areas with the feng shui woods in Hong Kong. Um, from everything you learned from this research project, if you could distill it down to three main takeaways to share with our audience, what would that be? 
One, that conservation can be approached from a variety of different angles and that I think everybody's perspective matters, right? And that includes the non-human animals too. <laughs> I think everything, everybody has, a, if ever, everybody has a stake in nature, right? In the environment. Um, that'll be the first one. Um, two is to really ask oneself why the protection of something matters, right? So to, you know, to, if, if we're going to, protect or conserve one species that's on the brink of extinction we should ask ourselves well of course there's a there you know there's some kind of moral obligation to it but really be sure that that's why we're protecting it so to protect potentially um go through this process of introspection to really understand why it is that we're motivated to do these things i think those two are the most important the third one would be to um i mean explore really just explore right see what people are doing when you you know if you're visiting somewhere because you're interested in the wildlife make sure to explore how the people that live in those places interact or perceive that wildlife right so what's the relationship between the the native traditions there the native culture with the wildlife that you're visiting to explore or visiting to to see a lot of gold nuggets there and i especially like your last point on traveling, like when we travel to new places, try to experience not only the culture or nature, but explore both and see how the two intertwine and influence each other. Yeah. And we can keep talking on and on, but it's time to wrap it up. So sure. please give us a handoff on where people can contact you, learn more about your work or any other resources you would like to share. I mean, I guess if you if you search my name on Google Scholar, you'll find most of my articles that I've written or that I've at least co-authored. You can find me on Instagram at, at Yamroots, Y-A-M-R-O-O-T-S. Yeah, you post a lot of original art there too, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. I do have my works up there. Um, Feel free to take a look and explore and um, be curious, ask questions. I'm always there ready to discuss. Yeah, definitely check out his Instagram. There's a lot of cool designs there. I'll include all these links in the show notes and the YouTube description. Felix, thank you so much for your time, and I'll see you in person very soon. All right, Sam. That's it for today's episode of EcoChat. All the resources mentioned will be available in the show notes. If you enjoyed it, please consider sharing and leaving a rating and review in your favorite podcast platform. It really helps the algorithm to show our channel to more people. And with that, we'll catch you next time on EcoChat.